All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Vivek again, uh, joining you to host the Aftermarket Champions podcast for the eighth episode today. I have a very special guest. His name is Pratik Chakravarti. He's a CEO of Zineer. And Zineer is a field services management company, a uh, software company that was started about six years ago, seven years ago. And Pratik's been at the helm of this company for the last couple of years. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Pratik and uh, join the show. Pratik, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, great to be here with you today. Well, Pratik, you know, I always start my show asking a couple of standard questions, mostly to make sure we're all kind of getting to know each other well. So obviously you and I met before, so I know your story a little bit. But maybe for the sake of the listeners, tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, how you wound up in this role eventually. What's, you know, what, what led you here, if you may? No, good, good. Yeah, sure, uh, Vivek. Uh, so grew up in India, mechanical engineer. Uh, didn't have a clue what to do uh, with my life. I was growing up uh, doing my undergrads during the dot-com boom. And 99% uh, of my friends were learning how to code. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy that. One dream I had was traveling across the world and uh, getting out there, getting out there in the field. So I was fortunate to find a job as a field service engineer in the oil and gas industry. That's what started my uh, love affair. Interesting. With these I forgot about that. Yes, you were out in the middle of nowhere for a while. I was, yeah. So I'd spent five years after undergrad, uh, primarily in Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, Siberia. I spent four winters in Russia, uh, working as a frontline engineer, drilling oil and gas wells, and loved it. Loved that experience uh, that, to a large extent, defines who am I today, uh, all the learnings that I took. The only reason I tell people I had to leave the job because uh, my wife said, I'm not coming with you to Siberia. <laughs> you better find a normal job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but jokes apart, uh, did my grad school, continued to stay in infrastructure, energy-related industry, and went into a field service role with utilities now. Mm -hmm. uh, then did a corporate venture capital stint in the Bay Area for the utility for a number of years. And, you know, being in the Bay Area, you're bitten by the startup bug. So, hey, I have one life. Let me try it out. <laughs> um, you have ideas floating all around. So I, I was yeah. fortunate to join a founding team selling software to utilities. The mm. goal was to help them manage their load better and reduce energy consumption. Amazing experience. You made every single mistake in the playbook that you can think of in eight years. Uh, learned a lot learned tons uh, and very good memories about that. And then Zineer came along. Uh, I ran into the founders. They had started a company, a good platform. That's where the field service connection comes in. They, they were, uh, I thought, doing something very interesting in the field service domain, which we can talk about. I got excited with, by the vision and joined them about three years back to lead the company and uh, you know, drive change in the overall field service world. That's my story in a nutshell. Still learning, still love learning, still making mistakes. Hopefully not the same ones we make. Hopefully not the same ones. You know, I think you're being far too modest. Yes, all of us make mistakes. But, you know, for, for the listeners here, Pratik is being incredibly modest because he and I went to uh, the same school system, if you may, engineering school system. And the place he went to work as a field service in the middle of Siberia, that was one of the most prestigious, jo prestigious jobs coming out of our school. So, Again, he's being very, very uh, modest, but that was like a remarkable thing. And of course, what I used to find fascinating, Pratik, about uh, your first job out of school is that all you guys got sent from India, or in your case, Kharagpur or Kanpur, to literally some random continent in the middle of nowhere with nothing close to you, right? How was that transition for me? That talk about shock, right? You go from a city and you go to literally the middle of, in your case, Siberia, but some, I know my, my former classmates have gone to middle of somewhere in Africa, in the middle of the desert as a field service engineer. How yeah. was that transition? Yeah, yeah, you see, uh, and we are talking about Schlumberger here, uh, yeah. 20, 22 years back. And this was all a part of well-designed curriculum. The, their concept was, hey, we will put you through this training regime. A key part of that includes putting you in scenarios that you're not familiar with. And, and we will invest in you and see how you cope up with the pressure. Mm -hmm. The goal is you do that for five, seven years, yeah, you get a holistic experience, and then you can lead any business anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. they were very passionate about that. 
Now, going back to my story, the fact that I wanted to travel the world, that's why I got excited about this. And I wanted to explore the new cultures. I wanted right. to go. So think about it. I, I grew up in India, hot and humid. Uh, the first time the, the, the first time I spent a winter outside India was in Siberia. <laughs> right? I, I still remember the reaction of the people when we had the first, I saw the first snowfall. Uh, and then those are the memories you keep, right? Even yeah. think about business. Business Absolutely. is all about different scenarios. How do you... Uh, adjust and adapt to different scenarios so right. uh, it, it was a it was a, a good and the other the other thing i learned which which kind of we have lost the way uh, as, as tech has taken over which rightly so tech is powerful there was a lot of onus on empowering people in the field it was all about hey <clears throat> whatever you are you have to spend time five six years in the field learn the tricks of the trade then you come back right uh, that has lost its sheen Right. Why do you know the industries that we target? Why do people uh, complain about you know scarcity of resources? There are mm. not enough people who are ready to work in the field and take a blue collar jobs. So if you look at the you know the top ten largest companies in the world today, it's all eight of them are tech companies. Back mm. then, it was very different. So that's what you know what I take away from my Shlomoshi experience and other such companies. The training program of how yeah. do you create the right resource pool to make you successful and, and the field will bring revenue to the company. I had yep. a great experience, you know, uh, tons of stories that we can share with huge, immense experience of uh, putting up with different scenarios, putting up with different scenarios. You know, there's something that uh, I think that between the IIT education and Schlumberger for you and for me, IIT plus uh, consulting and GE, right? You learn how to learn really, really quickly in a whole variety of different environments. Yeah which I think is an incredibly underappreciated experience and skill. And you got that in huge amounts at Schlumberger and IIT, obviously. But then, you know, those are the things that you carry forward. So, you know, fast forward now, if you do three years ago, tell me a little bit about Zinier and the, the problems you solve and for who do you solve these problems? Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, Zinier is a software platform field service automation. So think of, in simple words, any company uh, that has distributed assets, distributed workforce in the field, we help them manage their assets and workforce and execute the tasks in the field, be it uh, you know, uh, connectivity-related, sustainability-related, manufacturing-related. I always tend to start with why. Why do we exist? Why I got excited about Senior three years back? And it all starts off with my field service story. Uh, if you, mm -hmm. These are McKinsey stats. If you look at uh, numbers, 80% of the workforce globally are frontline people, Vivek, not people like you and I you know, right. sitting at the desk, uh, 80%. Now, yet majority of the innovation, workplace productivity-related innovation are targeted towards people like you and I. And, and they're great products, great innovation. And the simple reason being entrepreneurs come from people like us. Right. 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 So... Um, I, I call this technology equity. It's probably a pet peeve from my field service days where you know, I was working in, in Siberia or remote locations you mentioned. I would get two minutes of connectivity every day. I was not allowed to send an email or call my parents. I, I had to send a report to my central office. Right? So it, it was, everything was against us, and yet we had to deliver. So the, this notion of how can we bring innovation to the field, right? So we are driven by that. We, we yeah. call ourselves, you know, uh, change agents are bridging that technology gap and making sure that innovation is reaching out to the field. We are empowering the field workforce. Mm -hmm. so that's got me excited. The, the change that Zinier, I, I believe Zinier has the right tools to bring that is because we have a platform. It's a customizable platform, uh, low code, no code. Uh, we can adapt the workflows based on the changing business scenarios. One of the challenges mm -hmm. we faced uh, 20 years back when I was in the field was, hey, if you're doing a work, if something changes in your operations in the field, you have to go back to IT to update the software, you have to get into the queue, you have to employ an SI. It was a nightmare to change something. So we had to be flexible and make things work. Whereas if you give them a low-code, no-code tool, uh, these changes can be done. So the vision is, hey, we go to our customers and say, we will give you the keys. We'll give you the power to adopt your changing business, to be the digital transformation change engine, and we'll hold your hand and get you there. So that's what got me excited about Zenir and the passion that the founders have. Uh, and that's what we're doing. We are on that journey mm -hmm. of working with our customers and making sure that 
We are helping them evolve and get their field service tasks done in a very Mm -hmm. configurable way. Mm -hmm. When you think of uh, the business you're in, clearly field service, like you said, 80% of the world's workforce is frontline people, not desk-oriented people, right? But you have to pick and choose a lane. You have to pick and choose the kinds of people you serve. So who do you serve? What kind of industries do you work with? Maybe yeah. a little bit of uh, clarity yeah. on that. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, if you go back, look at our unique selling points or why we win deals, it's the flexibility of the platform, right? That's one. Number two is we excel in verticals where there is a need to manage and schedule workforce. Mm. So our scheduling algorithms are very powerful. Mm. So we find uh, in our early days, we're finding a lot of love in similar industries like telecom, energy, even manufacturing, where there is a large global workforce Mm -hmm. and there Mm -hmm. is an opportunity to drive productivity gains by better scheduling and more flexibility. Mm -hmm. For example, manufacturing is, an uh, as we are learning, uh, we have enterprise customers. It's an exciting sector. You know, there is, and you you must be seeing that, Vivek, this drive towards servitization. This transition from, hey, I'm not no longer just installing an equipment and walking yep. away and coming back to break fix. I want to maintain that ongoing relationship with yep. the customer, deliver yep. value. Yep. That brings in the need to optimize the workforce and manage that. And that's where we uh, come in as a field service automation platform with our best practices to uh, deliver value to our customers. When you talked about utilities, you talked about telcos, you talked about manufacturing. I know from past discussions, you guys got your start, I'd say, in telco. You moved to utilities because it's a huge uh, telco-related, I mean, utilities-related stuff, a huge yeah. field force. You're now also transitioning to manufacturing. Are you seeing some common themes across each of these verticals as you go across them, uh, Prati? Yeah, we do. We do. And, and, and this is... That's a good question. It's aligned with our focus and passion area as well, which is how to better empower the field workforce. Now, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, the common thread across all of those, there is a need to better schedule and manage the workforce. And, and if you look at the transition, and, and it's the same transition in telco, right? Now, you, or energy, you have to make sure that people going to the site are safe and they're getting the job done right at the first time and managing customer relationships. If you look at the parallels in manufacturing, hey, I, I'm no longer selling you an equipment and forgetting it, and then if something breaks, you ping us, I will come and we can sell it. I want to manage that relationship on an ongoing basis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of our customers, you know, I, I was talking to them, they, they went through this transition of, quote unquote, shifting the power base from the office to the field. Mm. As a part of this servitization initiative, they empowered the field people. You know, these mm. are people who are installing the equipment, testing equipment, meeting the customers, they are closer to the customers, decision-making completely shifted to them. Mm-hmm. They wanted better visibility into what was going on so that they could empower. That is the common thread I'm seeing. Um, mm-hmm. Leaders mm-hmm. who are getting this fact right that, hey, if we don't take care of our field workforce, we'll run short of them. There's mm-hmm. not enough people out there. So you have to focus on that and make sure they're empowered. That, that's the common thing across all fields. Mm-hmm. CEOs who are not getting it, Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting what you just said. So we hosted an executive advisory board about, uh, I'll say, three weeks ago right now mm-hmm. with some of our, what I would say, more thoughtful, progressive customers. And if there's one thing I took away from those day, from the day and a half of them was this incredible need to make the most of the workforce they have because of what you said, there's a massive transition going on, as some people call it the silver tsunami or the great mm. shift change or whatever, right? I mean, the the older workers, the more experienced workers are retiring in droves. I think in the next five years, like 25, 30% of the workforce mm. in these industries is going to retire. I mean, they're well over the 60s now. And the fact of the matter is that the younger generation or the newer generation is just not coming in at the rate that these manufacturers, these companies that you work with, the telcos, utilities, or manufacturers in our case, the need. And I think from that point of view, what you're doing is actually interesting. You call it empowering. I call it in very practical terms, productivity, right? It doesn't mean you allow your customer to go reduce his workforce or, or you know, do something different. You're allowing them to do more with the workforce they will have tomorrow because you plan and schedule them better. You get them optimized better in terms of 
who's trained for what kind of product, for which kind of installation, which kind of service, and get them in the right place. I mean, I was talking to a customer yesterday, mm-hmm. actually a couple of days ago, and one of the points he, he's trying to do, which is actually something interesting for you to consider, and I, I, it's not something I can deal with, they have, this is a multi-business unit company, mm-hmm. a couple of billion dollars company. They have a bunch of technicians that are trained first, second, and third level technicians. Mm. Some on the field, some on the uh, depot, some on the office. And they're trying to figure out how to cross-train and make that capacity available across all the business units. Yeah. Not just for you know, business unit A, dedicated teams, business B and C. It's across it. And it's a combination of what you're doing, which is freeing up capacity uh, by better scheduling. Yeah. Or being able to, you know, help these guys reskill stuff with the extra capacity that they get, right? So yeah. it's an interesting transition. And so the role you're playing in these industries is pretty critical, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things you're right, Vivek, and uh, one of the things we did for our one of our telco customers in the UK, the, this tying in the capacity, uh, forward-looking capacity management with the scheduling algorithms. You're right, and uh, driving those productivity gains based on uh, that. That is a right thing. On a softer side, we have an internal slogan in our product team. We call it making blue collar sexy again. Mm-hmm. Right? You, mm-hmm. you were talking about when we were you know, coming out of IIT and people were looking forward to the schlumberger and those kind of jobs, blue collar work, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because of the evolution of tech, you know, everybody wants to code now. So internally, we are driven by this, this goal of, hey, how yeah. can we build products and give experiences so that blue collar becomes sexy again? Yeah. And, and that's what we are driven with. Like we, we, whoever we hire, we, we tend to drill into their heads that, hey, these are not normal industries, right? Mm-hmm. These are very, very archaic, very old school industries. And we are trying to drive change uh, in that from a workforce perspective or processes perspective. And we are passionate about it. So a couple of questions, if you may, when you think about the workforce, when you think about some of the, the activities that you're focused on. In, in a typical company, you know, title sells to the VP of aftermarket. Uh, who do you sell to? Who's your eventual buying champion? Uh, who's yeah. the person making the decisions in the variety of yeah. different companies that you sell to? Yeah, we have, we have two lines of businesses. Uh, typically, what we call field operations or field service and IT. Mm. Uh, it's roughly, I would say, a uh, 60-40 split in terms of who owns the budget. Mm. Uh, but both of them will be involved in the decision. The, mm-hmm. the pain is felt by the field service the operations, operations yeah. team. VP yep. of operations. So she or he will initiate it. IT will come in more from a standardization and, and technical and digital transformation perspective. Mm-hmm. So both are important. Uh, and then figure out who owns the budget and drive that process. But yeah, both are e- equally important for us, VP of ops and VP of IT. As you transition, not transition, as you introduce a manufacturing vertical into the Zenir uh, business, are you seeing things that what you did with telcos and utilities in the past can be carried over or conversely cannot be carried over into your thought process, how you approach these guys, yeah. what are they thinking about, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good. See, there, there, there are similarities from a field execution perspective. The fundamentals remain the same. You have to get people and parts at the right place at the right time and en- enable them to get the job done. You know, having said that, as you know, uh, these, I call it the core industries, uh, they all have an element of verticalization. So Mm -hmm. there is a need to understand the language, understand the workflows. So Mm -hmm. what we tried on is building a library of workflows, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That that are out of the box and that can be further customized. So the way we approach it is, hey, we we are here to learn. We are field service experts. We are not manufacturing experts. And that's how we got connected as well. Mm -hmm. We know field service. We don't know manufacturing that well. Yes, Mm -hmm. we have customers. We would love to learn from you. We bring our learnings from a field execution perspective across industries. And then the tool that we have, which is a unique selling point, it's the flexibility of the platform, right? Mm-hmm. So we mm-hmm. can stitch together workflows quickly based on our uh, exchange. So mm-hmm. we do a consultative thing. We become the field service experts. We set up a center of innovation. We ideate with them and say, hey, what are your digital transformation goals? And then let's work on it together. So more as a the learner mindset mm-hmm. with expertise in field service. That's how we approach these verticals. 
You know, you mentioned servitization a couple of times as you think about uh, the transition that's happening in industry uh, around us and my the business around us. You know, as, as I walk where I live out here, there's a big field service presence, believe it or not. The, the local utility is busy redoing a ton of the transmission towers, right? Mm. Uh, they're working on maintaining and managing that, that the service companies maintaining and managing it. But in the world I live in, which is manufacturing, the notion of servitization is actually interesting because it addresses two or three things at the same time. Right? One is there's a huge pressure on CapEx, if you yep. may right now, compared to OpEx. So people don't have big gobs of cash sitting around to go deploy into assets. That's right. point number one. Point number two, which you talked about the transition of the workforce is a huge deal. So many of these customers of my customers are short of people. Mm-hmm. And so they need somebody to maintain and manage the asset. And the third thing, candidly, what happens in many of these cases is coming back to the CapEx versus OpEx, you wind up doing a big CapEx investment that may or may not get utilized to the degree it should mm-hmm. over time. And being able to match your expense to the value it's creating is really something valuable in terms of the servitization thing. Are you seeing that as a driver, as a tailwind for you, or is that just the beginning thought process you're seeing right now? Where's, where's that transition in your world? Yeah, see, the, 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 that's true. That's true, Vivek. The, the <clears throat> biggest pull that we are seeing from our manufacturing customer base is very customer-driven. So what, 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 and, and these are ops folks, and huh? what they're telling us is, hey, listen, we have to do a better job as, at maintaining and managing a relationship with our customers. Mm-hmm and be more proactive about it, right? So moving from a transactional relationship to a very dynamic dynamic. relationship, right? Consultative relationship. Of course, you talk to the finance guys, they will tell you their reasons, right? Hey, I want more subscription revenue and not one-time revenue, make it a stream. Uh, And also see, the the, the nature of the relationships have changed, has changed with the advent of internet, information is everywhere. You know, you no longer can, you know, just sell and forget and be SLA driven. Uh, customers have a lot of information. Mm-hmm. That drives the change. Okay? How can mm-hmm. we be more proactive in managing our customer relationships? So, yeah, there are two elements to it. One is we have to be more productive, to your point, that the workforce is uh, constrained. I'm not getting a steady supply, so let's try to get more productive. There's also a revenue generating opportunity. Mm-hmm. If I am more consultative with our customers that ensures that I have the relationship for a longer period of time and there will be more revenue there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating to hear that, you know, the companies who are getting there, they are ahead of the curve and those are the ones we want to work with because yes, that's what we will enable. Uh, and then the finance guys tag along and said, yeah, of course, that's what we want, the subscription right. revenue and the SaaS right. multiples that comes along with it. Right. right. You know, you, you said something interesting, right? So you talked about customer and proactive service and customer experience and so on and so forth. You didn't exactly use all those words, but it's interesting. Uh, the people have done this podcast interview with so far six manufacturing companies or seven manufacturing companies, actually. Every one of them to a different degree or the other actually said the same thing, mm. right? Uh, being more proactive with the customers to get them a better experience, uh, improving the customer experience, right? Uh, Customer experience is key for long-term relationships, right? So all these things, they've all been saying the same things. And I wonder if that's kind of some of the shift that's happening. I mean, I hate to say in a, in a very, uh, in a very blunt way, but I wonder if there's two things going on, right? The, the generation that's coming into management in many of these companies is more attuned to customer experience mm. and customer service than the older generation, maybe older is the wrong word, previous generation that was used to reacting, responding, and just giving the customers what they want. Just yeah. proactive about it, right? I wonder if that's a big generation, uh, in a good way, uh, the generational uh, transition that's creating this change as well, right? Yeah, and, and Vivek, I think you're right. I'll give you an example. See, we, we talk a lot about this on the sales side of the world, right? If you look at selling 25 years back, I, I, I call it the, the selling the, the old car, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an information asymmetry. Mm-hmm. Right. The person who's selling the product or the service has information that the customer doesn't have, right? Mm-hmm. So you excel on that. With the advent of internet, that is taken away. Mm-hmm. So your entire approach 
to dealing with customers has to change. Mm-hmm. I think similar stuff is happening on the services side, on the manufacturing side. I, I absolutely think you are right. It is a generational shift. You know, a lot of the younger leaders that we deal with, they get it. They immediately get mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. right? Like we have to change. We have to adapt. We have to digitally transform. And it starts off with the customer. Mm-hmm. And let the customers define what they want, and then we will adjust the processes to that. Uh, that's actually good. Going correctly, they, they, they are getting it. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great shift that's happening. I think it's been long overdue, honestly. Uh, being able to put the customer front and center of what you do is really the way to think about it. So I'm glad to see these uh, changes happening. You know, I, I'm going to uh, maybe steer the conversation a bit parochially towards something that I care about, which is, you know, for your customers, especially manufacturing customers, or for that matter, even your service and telco and utility customers, right? They have what I would call it entirely, we would call it installed base of assets yeah. out there yeah. that they're trying to make sure they serve and servitize and so on and so forth. Yeah. As you think about your customers, as you think about the relationships they're trying to engender with their customers, do they think about it in the context of the assets in the field? Are they thinking about the context of my customers using this asset to get this outcome, therefore make sure the outcome is better? Or is it both, right? Because at some degree, field service is about the asset for the most part, not every time, right? It depends who you serve, but it's about the asset. How does yeah. that install base asset thing work in, the, in your experiences so far? I think, Vivek, it's both. It is both. It, it, it is, uh, and you, you bring it up well, it's about knowing your install base better and also what outcomes you're trying to drive. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. take two separate examples. Right? I'll take a non-manufacturing example first. You know, there are transformers out there in the field, mm-hmm. right? Utility transformers. Now, uh, I live in the Bay Area. Uh, some of the older neighborhoods here in cities, these transformers are really old. Mm-hmm. If you go to the local utility or any local utility, they will have zero clue about transformers. Yeah, yeah. When was it? Service, maybe they have, but what's the age? What's the spec? Uh, how old is it? Now, if you, there are some neighborhoods in San Francisco, let's say there are 10 homes on one transformer, you put two EVs charging at the same time in peak load, hmm. transformer will break down, right? So utilities, energy utilities across the world are scrambling just to right. better understand the install base, whether it's gas right. pipelines, electrical assets. So that's just, under, we, I know how my customers use it. I just need to know what is going on with our assets. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Now, on the manufacturing side, the customer, their customer's customer experience also comes in, right? What mm-hmm. is the outcome that you want to derive? And maybe our customers, they have their customers, their relationship is changing. And we work a lot on the testing measurement and electronics side of the house, right? Mm-hmm. These are companies who have testing equipment that they install and their customer space, right? Their relationship with the customers are changing. They are mm-hmm. looking for a particular outcome. Mm-hmm. But they're also interested in understanding data from the install base so that they can influence their outcome better. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that well, I remember the early days of Zinier, and this might have been related to planning and scheduling, but I think there was a fair bit of AI yeah. infused into a lot of the core technology that we developed. That was for planning and scheduling. Are you also using AI for predictive and preemptive signals to your field service uh, users to say, hey, based on everything we've seen, there is a potential for these three things to happen or yes. you're at the beginning of that journey right now. Yeah, yeah. We, we are very, very excited, very excited about uh, the use case. As, as you can, as you know, we make a lot of natural applications of AI. Like mm-hmm. I have this pet peeve about AI and technology. We get enamored with the technology. We forget the use case and why it is important. In our world, the application and the benefit is very clear, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine if you talked about the planning and scheduling, right? Your algorithms will benefit from AI, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The predictive aspect of uh, uh, things. You're sending a, a field service worker out there in the field, uh, empowering them with you know, knowledge management, insights from what has been done in the past. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of good applications. What I'm excited about is, you know, we don't plan to build any LLM, LLM or NLM will just uh, Take integrate it. what's out there and the yep. use cases are there. It's yep. absolutely, even inventory optimization, think Perfect. about parts inventory optimization, how right. much you can do. I right. wish I had unlimited capital and infinite resources to get to that. We, we are right. taking it on one at a time. We have right. tackled it on the scheduling side, but the, I, I tell everyone, you know, uh, 
technology is great. Think about the use cases and mm-hmm. our use mm-hmm. cases, uh, you know, in the, any vertical, after yeah. market, telco, energy, it's really powerful. And that's why I'm excited about AI. You know, the fascinating thing about what you just said is, you know, there's a framework that I read about a long time ago uh, by Clay Christensen about jobs to be done, right? It's a very oh, yes. common framework people use. And I think to the point you just said, I always tell people, look, you can think about any technology you want, but if you don't think about the job to get done and what you're fundamentally the changing about the job or improving or eliminating or whatever it could be, you know, that's something if you keep that in mind, then you can apply the right kind of technologies. LLMs do make this problem better and simpler, right? That's how I've always thought about it. I think that's an important way. I think Vivek, you're going to bring that up a topic. Now we can talk for an hour. I was fortunate to be uh, taught by Clay Christensen. Uh-huh. I'm a huge fan of disruptive Lovely. innovation. A yeah. lot of uh, jobs to be done. An entire theory. Uh, uh, I, I, right. you, you probably can see the smile on that's my face. Right. That's video. Right. Fascinating. You're right. Yeah. Focus on the job to be done. We get yeah. enamored with technology. What is the value it is bringing? You're absolutely right. You know, the the interesting part about what's been going on in this world is, you know, coming back to your point about the transition, the empowerment of the worker and the field worker, uh, the customer experience uh, movement that's kind of beginning with the generation change. You know, one thing I can say to you is drawing back to the conversation I had with my executive advisory board recently and also all the different prospect and customer conversations I have all the time. This worker shortage, both field and desk, is going to be a huge deal for people. Have you thought about, in the context of Zineer, in the context of the innovation and the technology building, have you thought about creating what I would call automated field service, automated, I call it, you know, I'm kind of trying to coin a slogan right now we call autonomous aftermarket. Mm -hmm. which is just a play on the whole autonomous driving uh, stuff we hear about. And the reason I started thinking about that is there's so much friction and all the human interaction that goes on everywhere, no matter how good the technology, no matter what goes on. I mean, I talked to my colleagues who are doing IoT, and the biggest pet peeve is that no matter how good the IoT is, a human friction that prevents stuff from taking place that should take place. Are you thinking about those kind of ideas for Zineer going forward? Yes, yes. In fact, automation is one of our core pillars uh, in terms of the value we bring. <laughs> we are big on it. Uh, and then speaking of the, the challenge you face is that human resistance. You know, if, if people in these companies, traditional companies, they're used to doing stuff in a certain way. For a long time. For a long time, right? right. So you, even if you get them accustomed to the idea of transformation, they will still want a human intervention. Yep. So I, I call it, when we talk about digital transformation with these with this target companies, I call it call, walk, run. Like yep. you, you paint a vision and immediately you see the reaction on the face. Then you say, hey, pause. You know, I'm not telling you that you will switch <laughs> tomorrow. Let, let, let us hold yep. your hand. Let yep. us get you accustomed to what this automation can do. I mean, we, we have a, on a platform, we have this recommendations, personalized recommendations, AI-driven, where we, it can automatically change and trigger routes. But mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. we have done as an interim step is, yeah, let a person press the button, right? mm-hmm. somebody on mm-hmm. the back half of the The next step would be, okay, once you're comfortable with it, then you can automate mm-hmm. it and mm-hmm. uh, different steps. So it's more about the education and yeah. you know, any transformation takes time. But yes, we are very, very bullish on that. Very bullish on that. But what are you guys seeing in the field? Like, uh, what has been your experience on automation? You know, there's two different things. One relates to what you just said towards the end, which I was, I was going to bring into. One of the lessons I've learned in the last nine years in title and previous to my, you know, 20 plus years prior to that is change management is so important to everything we do. And to the point it just made people are used to doing certain things. And where we've got to in the context of entitled and deploying the entitled technology in the manufacturing companies is I have become really very direct with my customers and prospects about how much they take on, how fast they take on, and more importantly, are they ready to absorb the technology, right? So we have this concept we call the aftermarket maturity model, which is not that different from any maturity model you talk about, which is to say, look, people are going to make the transformation from a certain point in their existence to a really more advanced state, crawl, walk, run, sprint, right? That's one metaphor for that. And I'm becoming pretty shameless about telling people to say, look, I don't think you're ready to get anywhere near entitled yet because you've got to put these three things in place first. Because a failure mode that I've seen, that's the reason I talked about this whole friction mm-hmm. of people, 
The failure mode we see in all kinds of technology implementations is the human change and maturity model uh, uh, progression that we see. So that's the big thing we see. And it's interesting is that some of my more, I'm going to say the word progressive or thoughtful customers, they're metering their adoption of our technology and other technologies based on the maturity of their organization. So I think there's a there's a opportunity to kind of blend this technology with maturity of the organization, yeah. maturity process to kind of make that work. That's the big thing we're seeing. The second thing we're seeing in our customer base relates to this whole automation part. People really want automation, right? That's point number two. But the third thing I'm seeing, which might be a little different from where you are, is that there is no mention of IoT rolling out to the volume, to the degree that you and I both need. Mm-hmm. If you, if we have IoT rolling out properly, your job as in your job as in the Zinier job becomes easier because you've got yet one more data set to bring yeah. in and decide how best to prioritize certain jobs versus the others, alert certain things, right? And there's not enough IoT data right now, or IoT adoption to make that easier. So that's the last part that's actually holding up in my mind, uh, some of the progression that both of us need to make. Yeah, you, this IoT, I mean, I remember in my previous startup, it was huge IoT push eight, 10 years back. I've not been that close to it. Is, it, is, is the adoption not as as high as it was predicted? Or uh, what's, what's holding it back? If there is value, is it the cost benefit analysis? Uh, what, what's the reason behind this? So I think uh, two, to two or three different answers. Are. One is in the incredibly high value asset place spaces, mm-hmm. that's adopted pretty nicely. So turbines and jet engines and power mm-hmm. plants and this and that, huge. And those things instrument directly into the control centers and you're fine with that. The Where the issue is the volume of the population of the assets that need to get instrumented are the lower end, but it's lower as in 50, 70, 100, $200,000 assets, which seems like, sufficiently high value assets, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not that high. So mm-hmm. there, it's the whole ROI. Okay, what's it going to take for me to retrofit something, get this data back, put this information, how much can I monetize it? What productivity is going to give me? So the calculations that people are doing haven't quite worked out, I think, in, in some ways to justify that. That's point number one. Point number two, because of my manufacturing background, what I tell people is like, look, this is not a trivial problem. Any manufacturing plant, you're a utility guy. Think of a substation, think of a grid, think of everything from a, from a power plant to all the way to distribution uh, generators, right? Our distribution transformers. The number of assets, the number of signal types is so incredibly high that it's a crazy many-to-many problem that people can't solve yet. Mm-hmm. Not at scale, not easily. So I think there's some just practical aspects of doing it. When I go to a manufacturing plant or walk around, there's maybe 50 to 100 vendors, each with their own you know, communications criteria, buses, whatever you want to call it. There's nothing talking to one another. So that mm-hmm. prevents and stymies the adoption there on mm-hmm. only high value asset credits. So I think there's some things that are in the way that get it. And believe it or not, the last thing I say to you is that in as much as we think that there's plenty of engineers who can take these signals from these devices and make sense of them, the short answer is there's just aren't enough. Mm-hmm. So I, <laughs> at the end is again constrained by the number of people who can do something with it, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm seeing right now. So, you know, those are the kinds of things. So, you know, as, as a way to kind of end this conversation, Krithi, you know, my question always to you is, you know, what next for Zineer, right? What's, what's the future? What kind of things you, are you guys working on that might be interesting to manufacturing companies? Yeah. Um, see, I, I, I'm smiling. I, I, the, I'll tell you a quick anecdote on how I answer this question. What, what drives me? I have two young daughters, twin daughters, 10 years old. And and uh, the thing that they, they still cannot figure out what Papa does at work, right? And the the, <laughs> the contrast to this is my wife works at Apple. She has been, and you know, Apple. We all are big fans. Uh, you know, she makes phones and laptops <laughs> and stuff. We still don't know what is the software and what yeah. Papa does. So why I mention this? I, I I want to do something that leaves an impact. Right. That, that, that for me is the big driver. And then why field service, big impact. And, and, and I, could, I, I can walk up to my girls and say, hey, look at this. This is the change we brought about. So that's, the, that's what drives me, Vivek. That's what drives me. In the near term, I think we, we are very excited. We talk about it. We are very excited about what we call it configurable AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, how we have turned it. It's on the platform. Integration with LLM, LLM, LLMs and 
we talked about some of the use cases. We're very excited about that. Uh, what we are doing on the low-code, no-code stuff in field service, there isn't anyone else doing it. So we'll continue mm -hmm. to ramble up on that. Like those are the two biggest reasons why we're winning deals. And just uh, excited about getting out there and meeting more customers and solving their pain points. You know, I, I, I as, as a company like you, we, we are passionate about what we do. It's not mm -hmm. a job for, me, mm -hmm. or for us. It's about making a difference. I'm fortunate about working with uh, a good group of people who share that passion. And and that's what creates magic, and that's what. Yeah. Creates. So that that's that's what that's what's next for us. We'll we'll try keep making the right impact, and and growing growing the company. Yeah. No, I think I think making the impact is what's going to grow the company. And the more you deliver value to your customers, and their customers' customers, that's how you're going to get the continued pull for driving growth. So, you know, that's great. I think uh, I think this has been fascinating. I think just threading uh, or you know drawing the line from your early days in Siberia as a field service engineer to utility experience to now running a field service automation company. And it's like life comes around full circle. You know, you're one of those guys who are making your, your persona's life easier, right? And I think that's actually, you know, an amazing manifestation of destiny is the way I call it, right? So it's been really fascinating to, to listen to the story. I think it's great to see how people are bringing these ideas to manufacturing, which is you know, just like you're passionate about field service, I'm passionate about manufacturing and aftermarket yeah. and service. And all these things kind of all converge at some point. And this whole servitization stuff is actually going to make that conversions happen even more quickly and more need for seamlessly, I think, in the next five to 10 years. So I'm, I'm going to be quite interested in watching this space and watching how Zineer progresses and transforms itself. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time today. It's been a fascinating conversation that's uh, going to be great. And I'm looking forward to is sharing this with uh, the rest of our mutual colleagues and interested parties. So thank you very much, Prateek. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you.